It's 20 years in Russia if you start an illegal aggressive war. The Russia of 2020, the Russia of 2021 is not the Russia of today. This regime is different even to what it was a few weeks ago. Western leaders don't understand this sufficiently and too many commentators are flaunting understanding that's much more superficial than they realize. This matters now because we are at the time of peril. What's at stake is our understanding of our exposure to nuclear risk. It's about nuclear war, nuclear weapons, and so we've got to get our heads around the new reality of the Putin regime as soon as possible. I um, cry about Ukraine twice a day, but if you want to understand Russian escalation, it's not about Ukraine. Ukraine is a frontier on a wider spectrum of Russian escalation. Understanding that is central to us understanding our nuclear risk. And eventually Putin may face a choice between standing back from power or trying to start a nuclear war. All of this we're going to break down in this video. In my video on the 13th of February, less than a month ago, I called Russia an informational autocracy. It still is one, but actually less than I made it out to be. If you're an informational autocracy, what you want to do is control the informational environment such that events swim under the surface of the informational environment without causing too many ripples. In that video, I said that the kind of war Putin likes is the kind of war that you look at and you don't know if it's a war or not. That's the kind of war you can remove from the news cycle at any point or just declare one without any facts on the ground changing. That's no longer true of the Putin regime. It started a war that has and will abruptly affect the lives of Russians. They're not going to have Visa, they're not going to have Lego, they're not going to have iPhone, they're not going to have social media apps. The regime couldn't handle the war informationally and so they had to shut down the last few remaining independent media. Interestingly, if their original Blitzkrieg plan had worked, the chances are TV Rain, Echo Moscow, this extraordinary platform that these bastards shot, that was Russia's main way of talking to itself, these platforms would have still been there if the Blitzkrieg succeeded. But once it failed, the informational autocracy structure could no longer handle the reality that was going to abruptly affect Russians. And so that media, because the war failed, boom, had to go. They were forced by events to rapidly restructure the informational environment. And that's not what informational autocracies do. Informational autocracies should be able to cope with a few islands of liberal freedom. But the way the war went, the regime fast reached a point where they couldn't cope with it. And there is a second change. Putin was losing power a little bit. He was in the mode of refereeing rather than leading the conflicts of the clans around him. But now there is a twist because he has used the war to grab more vertical power for himself. But that hasn't actually consolidated his position. What it's done is made him more central, but actually more vulnerable. Now take a look at this. This is Putin a few days before the war humiliating Narishkin, the head of the Foreign Intelligence Service, a clan that is less enthusiastic about the war. And look at Narishkin's lips shake and his hands tremble. And he is not trembling because he thinks Putin is going to throw him in a dungeon. He is trembling because he is realizing that the war is going to happen and he is realizing what that means and he is also realizing that Putin is smearing responsibility for what he's about to do on everybody around him. Do you want to start the process? No, I... Or to the I... 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 Поддержу или поддерживаю? Говорите прямо, Сергей. Поддерживаю предложение. Так и скажите, а, так, да, та так или нет. Говорю, да? Поддерживаю предложение о вхождении 
Донецкой и Луганской народных республик в состав Российской Федерации. Да, да, мы, об этом, мы об этом не говорим, мы этого не обсуждаем. Мы говорим, мы говорим о признании их независимости или нет. Да, я поддерживаю предложение о признании независимости. So what is going on in the isolated capsule at the top of the Kremlin? I think they've got at least three problems. They've got an information problem. Trying to cut out criticisms, they've produced a situation where they're not having access to information, they're not having access to constructive dialogue, they're not having access to feedback. They've also got a frozen rabbit in the headlights problem. One of the architects of early Putinism, Gleb Pavlovsky, who's long ago jumped off the ship, has said in the last couple of days that these people, just these people you, you saw sitting in that room behind Putin and Narishkin, that these people have stopped thinking and that they have stopped hearing themselves. And the third problem they've got is fear. And what they're afraid of is basically what the hell is going to come, both of their careers end of their lives? How do they strategize for a future under the circumstances of all of this change that's happening and all of this change in the nature of the regime that's happening that we briefly touched upon earlier? So this is what I want you to put on repeat before we arrive to the nuclear question directly. The logic of escalation of that gang at the top of the regime goes beyond the Ukraine. Escalation for them is not a means to an end. It is the mode that they are in. So forget about these conversations which you're seeing everywhere. What is Putin's plan if he stops halfway in Ukraine? What is Putin's plan if he goes all the way and somehow manages to at least temporarily hold of Ukraine? Where is he going next? They don't have and can't make plans like that. That capsule you should think of it basically as a kind of escalation machine that can keep on escalating but can't make any concrete plans. So what are they going to do next? What is Putin going to do next with their complicity? Putin has a briefcase. There are tools in it. He will keep getting out one tool after another so long as the previous tools don't work. Now, there are two tools in that briefcase we're going to talk about. One is a tactical nuclear strike, which Putin is open to using. And the other is not World War III, but escalation of the chances of World War III, so as to see what that escalation brings about. Maybe it creates kerfuffles and changes that allow things to fall back to Earth in a position more favorable to him. Let's talk about this. So please now sit tight. One of the tools in Putin's toolbox, in his briefcase, is a delimited tactical nuclear strike. Putin is ready to use that tool as long as he feels the circumstances are right. Here is Christo Grozev to tell you more. Christo is as well informed as anybody in the world on the dynamics inside some of Russia's military and intelligence institutions. <laughs> более конкретных э, данных, от конкретных источников, близких к нему, очень близких к нему, которые вообще в шоке тоже рассказывают о том, что он готов применить ядерное оружие, что, э, скорее всего, скорее всего, вообще пойдет на это, если война не удается, конвенциональная война не удается, успехов нет. И опять было повторено то, что, скорее всего, это не будет не будет украинской территории, будет какая-то из соседних натовских государств. Так что эм, я еще раз хочу ответить э, так, что мы как аналитики можем пытаться понять его мотивацию, понять э, для обычного человека в его позиции, обычного политика в его позиции, какие шансы, какие выгоды, какие минусы, как он подсчитывает это. Но у нас есть здесь конкретный источник, который его знает лучше, чем мы, и они боятся этого. То есть мы должны как-то им дать кредит, доверие. Если они считают так, то мы должны это воспринять очень всерьез. So how should we understand what Christo has said there? Could Christo be lying? No, Christo doesn't lie. Could his sources be lying? Yeah, they could. But probably what's going on is that at least somebody, 
close to Putin is hypothesizing on the basis of experience that Putin is open to a delimited tactical nuclear strike. And against whom? Against what? Against Ukraine, you might ask? Probably not. That might be hard to sell, even with all the media repressed in Russia. The population might not buy that. So it could be against NATO infrastructure. It could be against a NATO military target in Eastern Europe without targeting civilians. And you might say, well, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? And I am going to tell you, you are not understanding the crisis because you are focusing on Ukraine. Putin, in his mind, is not at war with Ukraine. Putin is at war with the United States. He is engaging in a kind of rollback of American and NATO military assertion against his borders. Now, is there an accurate assessment of what's happening? No, that seems rather psychotic to us. But that shit is in his mind. He is not fighting Ukraine. So the mistake you are almost certainly making watching this video is that you are seeing this as a Ukrainian war. You're probably watching Johnny Harris's second video on this crisis, which says this is a war Putin can't win. But what's wrong with that video? Well, it takes Putin to be basically at war with Ukraine. There is a frontier of escalation that is tragic beyond imagination. It's unspeakable. That's Ukraine. But there's a process of escalation that runs beyond that. And so don't think that Putin is engaged in a war against Ukraine. In one of our previous videos, we report that Putin refers to Ukraine as territory. Please relax and let's talk about a global nuclear war. There is a kind of defense mechanism that just kicks in and most people don't want to go there or they just say, well, everybody's going to die and so it doesn't really matter. It's not worth talking about. Well, it's first of all worth talking about even after it happens because people will survive in vast, vast quantities. But the second thing that's even more important is you've got to do everything in our power to prevent it. So Putin wants to escalate the chances of World War III without causing World War III. That's a dangerous game. It's an expression of a dynamic that's been going on for a while. Very few people know the Putin regime better than Gleb Pavlovsky. Here is Gleb Pavlovsky speaking four years ago. He, Putin, believes that when he pushes things to the edge, something will fall into his hands. He's like a gambler. Here is the great military expert Alexander Goltz, and he's talking about Putin threatening nuclear war. This is dangerous because in every upcoming crisis, Russia will use what it considers its trump card. Where do the people come in? Could Russian people stop Vladimir Putin's escalation on both of these nuclear fronts? At the moment, no. If anything, they might even support him. You've got to understand that Russians, and this is a vast generalization because I'm covering some people who are the very opposite of what I'm about to say, the majority of the Russian people are passive. They are not citizens. They are a population who think of themselves and are treated by their government as though they were living on a territory. Do the Russian people have a breaking point? Yeah, they do. But it's far, far, far off from where we are now. If you were to compare Russians and Belarusians and Ukrainians crudely as three peoples in terms of how they might protest the regime, you could say that the Belarusians are first to come out but last to engage in violence. The Ukrainians are second to come out and are readier to employ non-peaceful means. The Russians are by far the last to come out, but when they do come out, all hell might break loose. How do we respond? Number one, realize that Ukraine is at the center of this tragedy, but that the logic of escalation of the Kremlin is independent of Ukraine. Number two, since Putin is caught up in the logic of escalation beyond Ukraine, it's very important to sort of break out of the idea that Putin has a plan beyond Ukraine, a plan to do nothing more or to go beyond Ukraine. He doesn't have a plan like that. The plan is just to persist in ad hoc escalatory actions and then see what happens.
Three, we've got to be aware that sanctions and penalties that we implement against the Russians might be taken by the Putin regime as an act of war. And they might be taken as an act of war by the Russian population. Four, I'm not advocating a particular action. What I'm saying is that whatever we do has got to be run and talked through by us as we run it through the nuclear filter. We want to keep the sanctions as they are run that through the nuclear filter. You want to increase the sanctions even more, run that through the nuclear filter. We are hearing Ukrainians imploring us for a no-fly zone over part of the country. We can look at that. We can look at NATO saying no, but we can weigh this up and say by how much are we willing to endanger the lives of billions to protect the lives of a European people terrorized by a debased regime in Moscow? This isn't an aberration. You may want to go back to pre-February 2022, but you can't because we're just in a different world. The thing we've got to do now is keep ourselves in this uncomfortable space of facing reality without freaking out and without running away from it. It's a space of informed discomfort and that will keep us safer. I want to take this opportunity to show you 30 seconds of the mayor of Chernigov describing the terror unleashed by the um, Russians. Скажи, пожалуйста, в городе большие разрушения? Кошмарные. Я не узнаю свой город, и это город, который бомбили с 23 по 26 августа фашисты. И они практически город был один из десяти городов наиболее, которые поддался, пострадал больше всех городов Европы, он в десятке наиболее пострадавших. И я вижу, что русские хотят переплюнуть фашистов, и они уже переплюнули фашистов в уничтожении города и в уничтожении мирного населения. И я не знаю, как они с этим будут жить. Putin реально in this video, we discuss some rapid changes in Putin and in the regime. But in many ways, the regime and Putin remain the same. To learn more about both, watch this video next.